We're going to begin uh, as the council sitting as the Board of Health and get an update on uh, COVID-19 and the county health planning. I believe Dr. Gales, are you going to lead it off? Sure, happy to, unless uh, Dr. Stoddard would you like to go. <laughs> okay, I will move quickly and then put uh, Dr. Stoddard on the hot seat. Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Uh, good to be here with you and hope you're continuing to stay safe and made it through the holiday weekend. We will continue to look at our numbers to make sure that we made it through the holiday weekend. Um, fingers crossed. Um, I, I will start with the numbers. Um, as you, for those of you who are following them, I know you all are. And for those of, at home, there has been some variability in terms of the numbers. We uh, actually had a, a couple of days where numbers have been low. Yesterday, in fact, there were 34 cases uh, reported, uh, and which was the lowest number reported since April 4th, I believe. So, uh, in quite a number of months. Now, this morning, numbers show a case count of 163. Uh, and so obviously you're like, well, are we seeing evidence of an, an uptick? Well, I will, based upon the epi statistics that we have so far, we think it's more of a reporting lag, uh, given the variability in the numbers. Uh, and in fact, uh, once we saw that, we had some intense conversations here to figure out, are we missing something? Now, certainly we will continue to monitor and follow. We've already initiated a conversation with the state to say, are you noticing any trends at the state level that that would suggest that this is uh, an uptick in cases or more so of uh, uh, an instance of a reporting lag and a data dump, so to speak? Uh, based upon the information we have so far, it suggests that it is more of a reporting issue as opposed to evidence of seeing an uptick in cases. But we will very closely watch that and monitor. Uh, and again, for those at, at home in terms of how we're moving forward, I can't underscore how precarious watching the data is right now um, and how sensitive the data is. You know, we have made tremendous strides and we've gotten to the point where we do see a three day average. And, you know, for yesterday, without today's case of 163, we had a three day average of 47 cases, which is definitely where we want to go. The key is we want to get to the point where there is no variability. That number stays low and we're not seeing even in the case of reporting lags, we're not seeing a one off day where we see a, a rise and then it coming back down. We want to see that number sustained and that that number continue to decrease. Um, so to give you some insights in terms of what we're looking for. Now, as it relates to testing, we have now tested 9.8% uh, of our population, which is over 102,000 individuals. Uh, we've conducted uh, over 115,000 tests at this point. Uh, the test positivity is 5.2%. Uh, we are averaging now in the county over 2,000 tests conducted, uh, over 2,000 tests conducted on a daily basis, which is inclusive of all of the different tests from, from the healthcare enterprise as well as those offered by the county. Now, given that the number has decreased again to level set where we are a month ago at the beginning of June, the three-day averages were in the 250 range. I think June 4th, it was 255. And to give you a sense of where we are yesterday, again, the three-day average was 47. Now, we, we're not saying, hey, we, we figure this out and we beat this. We're actually honing in, again, continuing to hone in to figure out the impact on you know, particular communities. One, we've done that geographically, and these are our items that I will be sending to you under separate cover. Uh, Dr. Liu and his team looked at, char charted the top 10 zip codes with the most cases for each month since uh, March, uh, as well as breaking it down by for those cases where we had race and ethnicity in terms of lab results. Now, when looking at the uh, the positive case rate per 100,000 residents from April, before April, April, May, and June, we have actually seen decreases in the non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and non-Hispanic Asian communities. While comparatively, we've seen increases in the Hispanic community. Uh, and given also the geographic data, you know, we've talked about this before, and it underscores um, continued efforts in terms of focused outreach to specific communities, uh, both from a race, racial and ethnic uh, perspective, but also as well from a geographic component. And as I mentioned, I will, I will send uh, that information to you all, because I can't share it on the screen, but I will send that to you all over email under separate cover. 
Now, in order to address this, we are continuing to work to expand testing in those areas. Now, our testing strategy, what we have been doing in terms of ramping up on a daily basis, we again with our testing buffet options. The stationary sites that have been in place for months now will continue to operate as scheduled. In addition to that, we are on a daily basis testing at multiple shelters, uh, have alt assisted living facilities scheduled where we also are providing testing as well as uh, when there are, with the mobile testing arm being able to go in, we've talked with the DND community as well. Uh, we had some conversations around correcting the PPE requirements and understanding it around that. And we'll be moving forward in terms of being able to test at the homes on demand or as needed. Uh, and we also have opened up Dennis Avenue as a test site for individuals to be able to come in and get tested uh, on a daily basis. Now, these are things that are in place already. And again, the other component is we have a number of uh, county employees who are being tested. Uh, Department of Corrections went live with their testing yesterday. Fire and Rescue has continued to move forward with theirs, as well as test kits have been provided to the Sheriff's Office and our police units to be able to test their frontline uh, responders and employees. So those things are in place. The things that we are adding and will be adding on as they come forward and get solidified and scheduled will be the pop-ups that are in respective jurisdictions. For example, similar to what was done in Tacoma Park, uh, there is one schedule for Friendship Heights tomorrow from two to six. Uh, we had a successful event at Middlebrook Gardens last week where we tested over 70 different individuals. Uh, and so as those get scheduled, we will be populating the calendar and letting you all know as soon as possible. Some of the other ones that are already in the works we've talked about before uh, are a testing opportunity in Silver Spring, um, as well as repeat testing at Tacoma Park and again, continuation of those sites that are in place. Now, I know that we have also received input and thank you Council Member Navarro for your memo that you sent last week with recommendations of sites. Uh, we've had an initial conversation with our, our recreation team about utilization of the rec centers throughout the county, given the geographic diversity there. The team is actually meeting with them this morning to discuss what that would look like and how we can operationalize and stand those up. And what those would provide is being able to have regularly scheduled an extension of our regularly scheduled testing sites uh, that are stationary is not the right word, but are fixed sites that are open on multiple days throughout the week. And so that would add any of the pop up testing in different venues would further add to the collection of options that folks have available. Um, the ready responders who we are bringing back on contract will be onboarded next week. Our volunteers from Project Hope continue to work with us in all of those different testing options that I mentioned, um, as well as we I mentioned before that we will be getting two trailers from the CDC. One of those sites will be at our Dennis Avenue Health Center and the other one we're working on in Up County area. We had hoped to use the fairgrounds, but we've got an alternative site for that. Once we can finalize that, we will let you know. Additionally, the uh, partnership that I had referenced that we are working with uh, Prince George's County and the state for additional support from CDC for disease control and EPI, will, uh, that team will arrive, I believe, on tomorrow and begin assisting both jurisdictions. Uh, other thing I want to highlight is we continue working with the state in terms of contact tracing. Uh, we have uh, our measure, our metric of contacting folks within the first 20, initiating contact within the first 24 hours is at 95.1%. We hired an additional, our first wave of staffers through our uh, contracting agency. We brought 12 folks on. We trained them last week. Uh, we now have 11 of them full time and they have begun contact tracing and assisting the team here. Uh, and we continue those discussions that I've mentioned previously with one community group in particular uh, about embedding contact tracers within their organization, which will specifically focus and impact going back to the epi data that I shared in the beginning of the presentation. One last thing to add is we are also as part of the testing arm, uh, working with a number of sites to be able to provide testing support to them so that they can offer tests to their clients. Uh, and some of those include some of our safety net clinics through Montgomery Cares and at least one other community venue 
um, who's looking to be able to provide testing uh, and a stand-up option that they are leading and supporting. I will stop there. Um, I'm sure there'll be ample questions and we'll be able to continue the discussion through that conversation. Thank you. Um, I have two uh, council members who wanted to speak. Do you want to wait, uh, Council Member Navarro and then Council Member Reamer, do you want to wait till after Dr. Stoddard or do you want to ask your questions now? Council Member Navarro. It's up to you, Mr. President. I just had a follow up question regarding um, the testing sites, but it's okay. up to you. Well, then. You and Council Member Reamer, are you in the same situation? I also want to talk about testing. I think it'd be fine to do it now and then. Uh, we can move on to the topics that Dr. Starr would have. Okay, then Council Member Navarro, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Dr. Gales, thank you so much for that update. Specifically, as you just shared, um, statistics regarding the Latino community uh, continue to be a concern. Obviously, there is a layer there to uh, the zip codes that we have discussed, specifically speaking, of course, um, with Wheaton. Uh, being a 20902 and being really the epicenter of the Latino community. Um, I was informed by Ms. Luisa Montero that the uh, testing site at the Wheaton uh, Recreation Center Library uh, Center is no longer going to be um, providing the test and that it's going to be now provided at Garage 45 at Amherst Avenue. Um, and so I wasn't, I had not heard about that previously. I wasn't sure how that has been communicated to the community, but given the statistics that you just shared, um, what exactly are, are we doing then to strengthen? I believe that um, what I was told was in this garage site, there would be an additional, I think 50 tests provided. But if we're seeing this trend continuing, especially as I said, in the Latino community, A, um, how is that communicated in terms of the change of venue? And then how does this align with what you are intending to do in terms of increasing the capacity in those highly uh, impacted uh, zip codes? Sure. So uh, first and foremost, the uh, the information is, has been communicated uh, through the call center in terms of when folks have been, been scheduled. Um, and I believe through the county website, and I will go back and circle back on that one. Uh, and the utilization was to maximize space. Um, now that said, that does not knock out uh, the rec center from being able to be used as a you know, potential site to offer pop-up testing, or at least you know for the uh, internal venue to be used to do the self-collection kits and mechanism uh, on a regularly scheduled basis. Um, so the goal is to expand and have multiple sites within the Wheaton area. Um, not just focused on one. So as we bring them online, the expectation is that there will be multiple venues and sites throughout the community, not just one concentrated area that would provide multiple spaces for people to be able to utilize uh, and get testing at the different sites. I appreciate that, except that this particular, in this particular instance, it seemed to me like that was actually contrary to this goal because, you know, to to basically shut down the Wheaton Library Rec Center after that was sort of the site that we were communicating to folks that, you know, this should go to, uh, and then move to the Garage 45. I looked for a Spanish language press release. I didn't find any, um, you know, that works against our goal of making sure that the community know um, where, you know, to go consistently, right? And so, that's why it was a bit confusing to me uh, why that was done. And again, instead of just, if we want to expand, let's just go ahead and have the two sites operating and let's do a very targeted, um, you know, public uh, sort of outreach and information to an area where at least we know geographically, right? That this is obviously where most of those cases must be coming from so that we can encourage people to seek the assistance. Um, so. Again, I, I'm just, I was just a bit confused as to why, you know, why that was done, the way it was communicated. Obviously, my office works very closely with this community, and we didn't know um, until we began to inquire uh, with, because of following up on my memo. Uh, so, again, I'm, I'm, I, I still don't understand how come we're not following um, the data in that way and to increase the testing from 150 to 200 daily. I mean, 50 additional ones, you know, it's a good thing, but I just don't 
I can't tell in terms of scope how much more that is, especially if we've closed, you know, a previous site where people now were, were familiar with. That, that very much is aligned to this conversation about, you know, people always talk about hard to reach communities, which I don't like that term. But the bottom line is that, you know, we're supposed to, in my opinion, we need to be consistent versus shifting things like this. It only creates confusion for anyone. Um, so again, um, and I, you know, I was told that there was an issue with the rec library center. So that worries me because you just said that we want to have both, but if there is an issue and that's not going to be a site, then, you know, where else are we going to place them? So there are lots of issues that pop up logistically. And so the, the, the rationale behind adjusting the site was to be able to have a site and be able to, you know, still function during the week while those logistical issues popped or were fixed and corrected. So, I, you know, we, I, I will confess, you know, I, I, I will take ownership of the notification. We will work closely with you on that to make sure that that's addressed and taken care of. So duly noted on that, take full responsibility for that. Um, as far as scaling up, again, we're looking, we're, we're trying to identify multiple venues within the space because one of the things, actually a lot of the feedback that we got even when launching the Wheaton site was that it was still not accessible to lots of people in the community. Um, and that's actually a lot of the, you know, the feedback we got, even though we had these spaces in place, was that, well, people still can't access them. And so what we've been trying to do is to, again, continue those for people who can, but again, to identify as many other places as possible. And I was hoping to be able to announce today to say, hey, here's those 10 sites, you know, we're continuing to work on those logistics, but it actually, we very consistent with what you're saying is, you know, we're trying to ramp up and create as many spaces as possible that are closer to the community. So for even those people who may live in the zip code and still have issues getting there with transportation, we're trying to stand up as many of those as we can uh, to get to exactly what you said. You know, we're in total agreement in terms of creating more spaces and more access points for people people to be able to get in and do testing. Um, so the goal isn't to remove any, it's to actually increase. And again, I, I apologize about the oversight in terms of communication. I know that's something that I don't think we have to relitigate the history that we continue to work with and deal on. And I, I take full responsibility for that. But I do want to say the efforts that we're trying to do are actually to expand the sites that are available to folks. And again, thank you for your recommendations that you provided. Um, in fact, that has served as the basis of particularly in the Wheaton area of potential sites that we are having conversations and talking with leadership um, of those respective um, facilities, and different things like to be able to stand up, whether it's a, you know, a one-off event for testing or something that we could stand up and do multiple days a week. I appreciate that. Um, I did send you also an email that I forwarded from a constituent uh, regarding some issues with the uh, testing hotline and the Dennis Avenue Center and things like that, and I hope in 311. So I hope that we're able to, you know, circle back and make sure that those things are addressed. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. I uh, want to follow up on that same line of questions from Councilmember Navarro. I think she really uh, identified some of the key issues. Uh, Councilmember Albernoz and I have been working together um, to talk about the need for a testing strategy to be written down and adopted by the county council mm -hmm. as a board of health regulation. Um, I am finding it very challenging to try to understand and manage from my obligation as council member, how we're doing this, you know, from a one hour public session every couple of weeks or a week uh, and a one hour conference call, you know, briefing. Um, and you know the, the the way that things are moving, how you know it, it seems like it. Sometimes there's a decision that's made, and then circumstances evolve, and a, a different decision is made. Um, generally speaking, I think we we have made progress. Um, you know, in my opinion, it could have been a lot faster, but we've made progress to bring capacity online. For testing, we have lab partners that will process tests if we give them the, the samples, if we collect the samples from patients. We are not collecting enough samples from patients to uh, meet our community's need on testing. I was recently reading the 
Harvard Global Health Institute, which put out a recommendation that a community's test positivity rate really needs to be below 3%. And in fact, a lot of the uh, uh, tests that are taken should be the result of contact tracing, um, not necessarily just random. And that when you achieve that level of testing and testing as a result of tracing, that you're really then on a path to suppress the virus versus mitigating the virus. And uh, you know, those, are, those are different for, uh, you know, for our community. I was very, I was very, um, you know, it was a uh, helpful to hear that framework from the Global Health Institute because it kind of clarified some of these key issues. And I know, you know, we we made progress, but we're still above five percent on our positivity rate. I think the, uh, you know, the suggestions from Councilmember Navarro, for example, about specific locations are good. You know, I think we've got to solve this problem of walk-up test sites. Um, you know, I'm hearing a lot of concern from residents about the, their testing experience and whether it is confusion about where to get a test or dissatisfaction with what happened when they, when they went for a private provider recommended test, they couldn't get a, a, um, a referral basically. I have one family contact me and say that they were not allowed to get a test and they finally pushed through and when they did, several of them were tested positive. Um, so there's there's still some kind of, you know, inconsistency with what we would want, and what the private providers are, are recommending. Um, and our I think our I don't know really what employers are doing to test their workers. You know, we, we know we want that, but I don't know if that is truly happening and what the county is doing to drive that. Um, you know, I had recommended last week. Uh, building on recommendations from many of my colleagues that we open the fire stations in the county as walk-up test sites. Uh, and the theory being that because fire trucks leave stations and everybody kind of knows where they are, like that's, that's a place that is very accessible and well identified. And of course, it's also distributed highly throughout the county. And we have people who are medical rescue, uh, you know, and technicians and employees and Theoretically, they ought to be able to support this kind of work. Um, so I guess I wanted to engage with you, Dr. Gales. You know, um, I, I'm interested to know what your view is of walk-up test sites at, at fire stations uh, in, a, in a general specific sense, or in a specific sense, but generally, um, you know, Council Member Albernoz and I have been working together uh, to prepare a letter um, that would ask for a testing strategy to be written down. We would we appreciate a draft uh, from the executive branch, but that the council should pass one as a board of, board of health regulation and uh, you know build on a draft we might receive from you, um, but also be prepared to just enact one you know that places a uh, you know sets up a, a program that we want to see achieved. Um, so uh, I know there's a lot there, Dr. Gales, but uh, to welcome your, your comments and uh, thoughts on that. Sure, I'd be happy to respond. Thank you for the, the series of questions. I think first and foremost um, is part of an, a pandemic or emergency response does require being flexible and nimble um, and having to make decisions on the fly uh, when the environment changes. Uh, and I think examples of that, for example, you know, as data comes in, having to be able to respond quickly and put in policies and strategies that address that. I think one that you're, you're very well familiar with in terms of face coverings, uh, in terms of when it was discovered that asymptomatic individuals could transmit when that was announced within a day, well, we actually had already put into place metrics for face coverings, but within a day, there was clear guidance provided, for example, to nursing homes in terms of how to change their practice in terms of requirements of PPE and face coverings and, and testing of employees. So um, there are times where it requires to act quickly. Uh, as it relates to, uh, at one point I want to clarify, so for anyone watching who may have had issues or problems with their provider providing a referral, we created a mobile helpline that's been in place for a well over a month now that if individuals do encounter that issue, 
they can call to our Dennis Avenue site and get access to testing uh, without having to have a referral from their private provider. So that provision has been in place for a number of weeks now for individuals. So if, if you have anyone calling your office who's had resistance uh, from their private provider getting access to testing, we can take care of that and provide a referral. Um, and in fact, it's a standing order with my name on it. So I can assure that they're going to get tested. Uh, now, the third component as it relates to mapping out where, how we're going about testing. So we have looked at a number of venues. So in fact, uh, venues such as the firehouse and other places we've looked at over a series of months, we've combed a lot of different and thought of a lot of different, both clinical spaces as well as non-clinical spaces that would allow for the opportunity to offer testing. Um, now, one of the sites that I mentioned that we are talking about today is the utilization of recreation centers. That would, um, they are geographically distributed through the county, um, maybe not to the level of firehouses, but they are, there's a lot of them throughout the county that has a lot of penetration and access for folks. That would allow for a high number of folks to be able to come through and get tested on a regular basis. Um, and so I have uh, also reached out to my colleague in DC, Dr. Nesbitt, to find out more information about how they're utilizing their fire stations. Uh, but consistent with their approach, again, they have multiple spaces where people can access and get testing, similar to what we've done here. And we're working again to create as many options and spaces for people to be able to utilize, um, not only on a daily basis, but also across the continuum, being able to you know, have testing at sites in the morning, in the afternoon, as well as in the early evening. Again, some flexibility in terms of options. So what we, again, creating the full spectrum of all of the different things that we have in place. So yes, there is a plan that can be, writ be written, but I want people at home to understand that we have an exhaustive list of options available for people to test that, pay that actually is, is more than a lot of other jurisdictions in terms of our stationary sites, our mobile testing, the helpline, um, use of the ready responders, as well as as we're bringing in the pop-up sites to be able to add, add spaces as well. We welcome and continue to welcome ideas or suggestions within that, um, and we will continue to study the viability and the feasibility of utilizing those sites because we have the shared goal of testing as many people as possible, and yes, it is accurate. Um, that the desired test positivity for any, any situation is to be below three. Um, and we are at 5.2%. In fact, multiple days this last week, our testing positivity actually yesterday was 1.9% uh, because we had 34 results out of over 2,000 tests. So we are, we are moving in the right direction. And certainly, yes, we want to test as many people as possible. Um, and in a perfect situation, you're also accurate. Yes, contact tracing would lead to testing and getting people tested. Right now, given the situation where we are, I think there's more of a focus on universal testing as opposed to waiting for folks to be identified as a contact and saying, hey, the assumption is, that everyone out there could be potentially carrying COVID-19. And so now with not only the CDC, but the recommendations that we put out as a county and that the state has also put out for private providers is there, excuse me, there's clear language for individuals who are asymptomatic to be able to get tested so that individuals such as the family that you reference won't meet such resistance when they get to a primary care provider or an outside provider. Um, and they, they can get tested more quickly uh, and easier and smooth. Thank you for that. So I do think we should proceed with drafting a Board of Health regulation. Appreciate your offer to or your willingness to uh, support that. You know, I think we've got to get to the point where we have thousands of hours of walk up clinic, of, you know, walk up site availability. Today we have about 20, maybe 30 hours per week where you can walk into a site and get a test. Uh, and there's three, maybe four sites. Um, you know, I think having 20 to 30 sites where they're open 12 hours a day would open the doors wide enough that we could then communicate to the community, go get a test, like go get a test. You want to travel, go get a test. You want to visit your family, go get a test, like a bit ubiquitous testing. And I don't think people believe that that is yet what they should do or can do. And you know, that certainly would be, I think, a game changer also. Um, so 
the, another key issue is the employer issue. You know, I don't know that we are aware of to what extent employers in the private sector that have frontline workers are following what guidance we think they should be following. I know we, you know, we issue the CDC guidance and we want employers to follow that, but are they? Um, and I think having an initiative to bring employers together to try to drive that message and communicate about what the public health requirement is for testing and then having widespread availability of testing uh, might also be uh, very useful. So um, thank you. As I said, I'm working with Gabe Albernos and we'll follow up with you on the idea of a uh, Board of Health regulation on, as a testing strategy uh, for the county. Thank you. Dr. Gales, I, I failed to ask in the beginning, are you under any time of time restraint? Uh, actually, today I'm not. So okay, all right. I guess I shouldn't say that out loud. I was going to say you probably. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say you shouldn't tell this group that. Okay. Um, well, I'm you guys go, last. So. Yeah, I'm going to go to uh, Councilmember Albernaz and then um, Councilmember Friedson and Glass are also on the list. But I believe both of them are going to wait for Dr. Stoddard to give his uh, his presentation. But Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll start with the very good news uh, first. Um, Dr. Gales, thank you for the collaboration on the special appropriation for the medical practices. Um, I do think that will make a significant difference and support our public health infrastructure and especially excited about the innovation component of that special appropriation, which I think can lead to planting some seeds after COVID on enhanced public health infrastructure across the county. Also want to express my appreciation for the pop-up site at Middlebrook and Tacoma Park um, those are very good examples of what we need to be doing a lot more of. And, uh, you know, I know how hard you and your team worked in those. And I do appreciate that we continue to have uh, the standing locations. Mm -hmm. um, but as Councilmember Navarro and as Councilmember Reamer indicated, you know, I think that the, the, the frustration, I, well, for context, yesterday I had the opportunity to visit the Quebec Terrace Apartments. There's a gentleman named Mario uh, he received one of the grants that we appropriated to do food distribution. Mario is a resident of the Quebec Terrace uh, Apartments. Uh, he has a small taxi cab company that he runs with uh, two colleagues. And as a volunteer, he has been delivering food to these families. Uh, and I went into one of the apartments, it's a family of seven uh, living in a one bedroom apartment um, and they have no access to uh, a vehicle. Um, and, and they suspected at one point, at least a month ago, uh, that at least three of their members of their family had had the virus, but they never got tested because they didn't have the ability uh, to be able to go to some of the locations that we had stood up and didn't know uh, where to access the information to be able to uh, receive the tests. And, you know, that's just one small but important example of the complexity that so many families are facing and that I know you're aware of. Um, but we've been talking for months, as you indicated, about standing up these testing sites. And, and I know that you, you have worked diligently with your team. And I'm also aware of the complexity of standing up these sites. It's, it takes a lot of work. There are a lot of logistical elements and coordination with the state and the bio labs. And there's the medical side, but then there's also the practical communication sharing. And and I just, I worry, Dr. Gales, that, that you have an incredible team that's working around the clock, but I just don't think you have enough hands. Uh, and I think that's a challenge. Um, and so have you been able to, and, and the council has been saying for months now that we are prepared to support enhancing your team uh, to meet the demand. And as you said, it has been a moving target up until seven weeks ago, there literally weren't the tests to even be able to administer, let alone the coordination of the logistics. But that problem has eased. Uh, and, and now the logistical challenges remain. So is, is there a need for us to provide additional logistical and administrative support to free up your team to have a point person in each of these individual areas, and in particular, these garden, these apartment complexes like Quebec Terrace, where we know there are still rampant numbers of cases and probably more than we realized 
because again, many of these people have not been tested. So could you respond to that staffing infrastructure? And, and honestly, do you feel like you have sufficient hands in place to be able to go from planning to action? Sure. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, and so the short answer is we, we, are, we never have enough staff. Uh, but to that end, uh, we part of the planning process that has been going on behind the scenes. And again, we uh, Councilman, to Councilmember Ringer's point earlier, you know, we, we meet in this hour long session on Tuesdays and then on Fridays. There's copious amounts of stuff that's going on behind the scenes and don't always share those details. But one of the, the tasks that the team has been working on is presenting models of what the staffing components would be to stand up these different sites. So everything that I mentioned to you in terms of all of the different options we're pursuing, one of the components of that is a human capital assessment. And so, you know, for example, the models, we have staffing models for what is, given we have a new system, you're right, because we, we didn't always have the capacity to do it, but given the new system, particularly as it relates to self-collection, uh, now that we have multiple events that we've done, we have a good sense of what the staffing components and needs are. And so that has been mapped out. And that is an ask that we are, uh, you know, submitting to say, hey, here's what we need. And here's what we would need, for example, from county employees who are uh, working from home or could be repurposed and reassigned. Uh, and so that's coming as well as um, you know, for example, the appropriations that were made for contact tracing, we are utilizing those funds and, you know, we've hired our first wave of folks already. We're going to hire probably ramp up and triple that number utilizing that particular contract as well as exploring, again, working with another agency to embed at least 20 to 25 more contact tracers within that group. So the short answer is yes, we have uh, now that, you know, as as the environment has changed, uh, we have models, staffing models and needs um, that are being looked at uh, from county HR perspective in terms of additional resources and staff members that could be supported. And the funding that you all have appropriated and provided is being used. Uh, and I anticipate as again, as this ramps up and continues to ramp up, um, we will be utilizing those resources even more. I appreciate that. And, and I know a lot is being planned. Um, I know a lot is being worked on. And to Councilmember Reamer's point, seeing it in writing um, it, beyond just a description within the briefings would be helpful, but mostly to the stakeholders in the community, the community partners that can then see that, know that it's coming, can anticipate acknowledging there's going to have to be an asterisk there's going to have to be a footnote that things may shift but to at least people know that a pop-up test is being planned in their community within some reasonable time frame um, and then allow stakeholders connectors like this gentleman mario i met yesterday um, to be able to work with you and your team um, and the leadership within your team to help get the message out to help get the correct message out uh, which can be very difficult in, in a number of these communities who already are very untrustworthy of government, as we've said many times before, to begin with. And we need folks like Mario to be the intermediary, intermediary um, to, to really get to the families who desperately need these tests. Uh, and, and not only from a moral perspective, a public health perspective, because these are also the same folks that are going back to work. Um, and so that, that makes it even more important moving forward. Um, Mr. President, I did have two additional questions not related to testing, but vaccines um, and another question. I'm happy to defer that, or would you prefer that while I have the floor, I ask those questions now? No, I think you should please wait. Uh, okay. We have uh, Vice President Hucker that is um, wants to speak on this to Dr. Gales, and then I'll put you, uh, you Councilmember uh, Auburn, I was on the list or after Dr. Stoddard speaks. So there's others in front of Perfect. you. But I'll be there. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I, I so much uh, uh, echo what uh, uh, Councilmember Navarro and, and Albert Oz and Reamer have said. Um, Dr. Gales, just a quick, quick follow up on the test, the issue of testing scheduling that you, you were addressing. Uh, my understanding from HHS staff is that they're touring the Civic Building in Silver Spring today uh, to get a quick walkthrough. And then it'll be announced when we're going to do the long awaited Silver Spring pop up testing. 
Yeah, so what happens is if a venue is or an organization suggests they're interested in testing is the team does the walk through to again assess what's the human capital need, what, you know, do you know what entrances need to be all that kind of stuff so um they are doing that today and once we can get that nailed down we'll be able to announce and move forward okay i was i just didn't understand the dependency why not announce the date knowing that this is a big building that's a public building and is widely available um and this is the top priority of the county and then um and then you know do the walkthrough and figure out all the logistics well, I mean, a large part of that is the logistics will determine, you know, the capacity. So if we get in and determine that the space could, you know, um, hold 500 folks versus 100 folks, you know, again, when we announce the information, we want to be able to the point earlier, make sure it's accurate. It's fact, we have a sense of what the staffing model, all those kind of things need to be. So it is done very quickly, you know, for example, in a venue like Silver Spring to say, you know, here's a visit and then we can launch from there. Okay, that, that's fine. I'll defer to your judgment. I just, I'm, I'm still st stuck on this question of uh, that others have raised. Um, I don't know the answer of whether you need additional staff or whether the very large, you know, executive branch staff that we have in multiple departments are adequately focused on supporting you because I get different information, it seems like every week. But, uh, you know, whatever we can do to get the full executive branch, the weight of the executive branch focused on supporting you, I think this is, you know, job one for all of us. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson to Dr. Gales, please. Yes, thank you for that. I echo all of the comments made by colleagues about testing capacity and uh, by uh, Vice President Hucker on the need to provide you with the resources that you need, including having the executive branch uh, adequately focusing on what has to be our uh, top priority. I don't wanna belabor that, but I just wanted to associate myself with all of those comments. Uh, I did want to thank you, Dr. Gales, for the pop-up you mentioned in Friendship Heights. Appreciate you working with the Village of Friendship Heights, with my office and with other stakeholders to make that happen. Key area, transit proximate, which is critically important as we talk about access, and also in the middle of a naturally occurring retirement community with a lot of uh, older adults who are vulnerable. And so I really appreciate uh, you all stepping up uh, to, to do that. And I just wanted to note that. Um, question with you uh, do we have an r not uh number the latest r not number and, and where is that trending sure give me one second i will pull it up so the r not numbers uh from july 1st again as we talked about before it's really looked at in a seven day approach um, given the variability, as you see, from 34 to 163. So the r not value, um, the most recent one to share, uh, it was 0.81 and 0.9. So the long-term trend is that we're staying below one, but we haven't necessarily reduced from where so, we've been. So the trend is we are saying there are some days, again, you can imagine with the report of 160 cases from today in terms of the, the data drop, it will fluctuate probably a little bit over one, but for the most part, the majority of the days we are below one uh, and usually within the 0.8 to 0.9 range. Got it, okay. And I uh, appreciate that. And um, I think it would be helpful if we could, I've been asking for this and it's not necessarily a question that, uh, uh, only for you, but. Uh, if that could be shared publicly with us and with the, the public uh, on the website, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't uh, share that and let folks know when it gets updated, uh, like we do with some of the other uh, data. So while I'm here, I'll just mention that. Uh, additional question for you. There's uh, been a lot of discussion, and we've been talking about this uh, re repeatedly since the early onset of this uh, public health crisis, but about the nursing home uh, question. There was a major Washington Post uh, story uh, about this, but the question of uh, shutting off admissions to nursing homes in order to control the transmission uh, of this. I just wanted to get a sense from you. There were some significant number of Montgomery County uh, sites that were referenced, including uh, frontline uh, healthcare workers at Potomac Valley who talked about how they were begging the uh, senior staff there to shut off uh, the admissions. Um, um, and then uh, referencing a, a certain other jurisdictions like St. Mary's that, that did at the first case of COVID and nursing homes uh, by public local public health orders 
uh, shutting down the uh, admission. I know we talked about uh, these issues and related issues quite a bit, but I just wanted to get uh, your thoughts on these issues, the fact that, uh, you, know, the, you know, these continue to be concerns of uh, residents, particularly those who have loved ones in these uh, facilities, and just wanted to get a sense from what your perspective is of how you approach that issue, what it would take, uh, you know, for a decision to be changed on that, you know, why we've done what we've uh, done, and any uh, thoughts about any changes, uh, perhaps moving forward on those issues related to Sure. Well, I think in terms of nursing homes, and, and I, I extremely value my colleague in St. Mary's, Dr. Brewster, who is the health officer there. Uh, you know, we are in a different situation. We have a lot more nursing homes than they do uh, in, in St. Mary's County. And so it's a little bit of a different environment. Um, and so there are there are clear, <clears throat> excuse me, criteria that nursing homes have in place in terms of accepting new admissions, particularly individuals, even bringing back folks who had been in their homes uh, and sent to the hospitals and then being re being released back to the nursing home uh, situation. So I think, and in addition to that, there are strict guidance and guidelines that have been put into place in terms of those facilities, in terms of reopening and being able to uh, meet those goals. So we continue to work closely with the facilities on that. We work with the state in terms of enforcing and emphasizing the emphasizing those requirements. Uh, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you offline from this venue to talk more uh, in detail about um, specifically what questions you may have or you know, to talk more in depth about our response and strategy around that. Um, I think again, to, to provide some historical context, when we had our first cases, we implemented the, the action team to work with them. Um, and we've continued to work with the state teams. The state is currently providing uh, universal follow-up testing for those facilities that continue to have cases. And we have continued to provide guidance uh, for those facilities as they are discussing and considering reopening their facilities. Okay, and do we think that the, uh, any, the issues related to the transmission rates in the facilities are going up, going down, staying the same? Do we have you know, so, understanding of, of, of what that looks like? Yeah, so in fact, we actually um, are working closely with um, some of our EPI consultants from GW uh, for some time now in terms of a congregate living facility special work group. So each week we go through and we look at the numbers to show which places still have cases as well as which spaces still have more cases versus others. Um, and the strategies that we've implemented, again, I think a big part of this is the uh, having availability for serial testing. Uh, and again, we were stepping up ready to do that when the state has stepped in and the state is providing testing for those facilities that continue to have cases. I think that's a big, big, big factor in terms of mitigating transmission because it's not only testing the residents, but it's providing testing access to all of the staff and being able to identify any continual cases, but also being able to triage and identify any new cases that could be potential sources of transmission. Okay, well, if you keep us posted on that, I appreciate it and I'll follow up uh, offline for uh, additional specifics in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard, would you please give your presentation? Good afternoon. Thank you for having me back. Uh, I do have a few things I want to highlight. So uh, first off, I do want to, obviously, I think many of you are aware of the good news this morning for Novavax, which is a uh, Gaithersburg-based uh, pharmaceutical company that did receive a $1.6 billion, with a B, uh, award from the federal government on, uh, you know, production of uh, uh, vaccine efforts between now and hopefully, you know, the end of the year. A lot of do fit. They're hoping to go into phase one trials uh, by the end of the week which is great news. It's obviously great news for the county. It's great news for us uh, in, in this response. Obviously a vaccine is would be a huge tool in the toolbox to be able to address the coronavirus long-term. So obviously that's good news. And obviously we're very supportive of it being a Gaithersburg based company and very much hope, hope, uh, hope for us in that arena. Um, a couple other updates. So through on one, we continue to see um, about 260 calls has been about where we are sort of um, our new, um, you know, set point that we've come to 
uh, over the last couple of weeks, about 11 to 12 percent of the total call volume most days. Similarly, about 285 calls overall for all call types in Spanish, about 12 percent call volume there. Uh, social service calls still remain considerably higher than they do they did a year ago. Uh, we had 472 social service calls yesterday, 19% of the total call volume, um, and that's up from about 5% of the total call volume a year ago at the same time. So that's obviously a fourfold or greater increase. Uh, we continue with our child care distribution. So the next, next distribution will be on Saturday the 11th. Uh, we're going to do a month worth of PPE and cleaning supplies for our, our child care providers at both our Dennis Avenue and Gaithersburg site public safety headquarters. So child care providers are welcome to come by and pick up resources, um, you know, cleaning supplies, PPE, uh, infrared thermometers, those who haven't gotten those already, uh, can certainly pick up. Uh, we continue uh, working on a lot of uh, recovery related activities, obviously, while we're concurrently responding. A couple of big ones, so our community recovery advisory groups, first meeting will be on July 14th. Uh, we have about nearly 50 participants in that, on, that, uh, on that group across all of the particular uh, stakeholder groups, uh, incredible demographic diversity, our LGBTQ community, um, you know, across the board, we've got really broad representation to give us feedback on how um, how we're, you know, doing reopening, how we're doing recovery and, and that moving forward. Elijah Wheeler from the Collaboration Council is going to be serving as the community chair for that group. Uh, and uh, we have our first two meetings. So again, the 14th and the 28th, we'll have meetings to discuss uh, collecting community feedback on our recovery process. I also do want to highlight quickly that Dr. Gales and I did meet with uh, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, Deputy uh, Superintendent McKnight uh, last week. And we are, we are both actually going to jointly do a walkthrough of one of the, the school locations on Thursday morning. Uh, obviously the school system has 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 shared their preliminary plan and we, we've seen a copy of it and been, been asked to provide feedback on sort of what they have been planning to do. And I think it's important for parents to understand that there is a, a there is a host, there's a range of, of ways that the fall could go and the, the virus will dictate a lot of the way that that will occur. I think everyone prefers, and I think the American Association of Pediatrics has, has strongly stated that in-school education is of extreme ben benefit to students. I think we realize that from a, a youth development perspective, from a, you know, from a, you know, Getting, getting people being able to go back to work perspective, but at the same time, uh, school environments must be safe to operate. And, and we appreciate that, the school system appreciates that. And so we will be doing what is in the best uh, long-term safety interest of our students and, and making those recommendations in that manner to the school system move forward. Um, we have uh, made a series of uh, submissions to FEMA, particularly to get policy rulings on some of the costs associated with our, uh, employee pay, particularly. We're also working on a next package of those uh, reimbursements, particularly as it relates to PPE that should go out hopefully over the next week or so. Uh, we, we did bring in some outside consultants to help us do that because obviously we don't have as much experience and, and I'll knock on wood saying that that's a good thing applying for major disaster declaration dollars as some other jurisdictions do, and we want to make sure that we maximize our opportunity to re to recompense the dollars. Just be, I mean, I mean, not we would do this otherwise, but we also know how important it is in this particular time that every dollar that we get available to the county can be a dollar that can go towards helping our residents, businesses, and others uh, respond to and, and recover from this event. So that's certainly our goal. Um, I want to talk about enforcement a bit. Uh, uh, we had a we had a meeting yesterday afternoon. We actually had a meeting before this past weekend. When I know, I know um, the media has picked up on um, some of the stories related to um, some some actions that either some businesses have taken or are I guess in some cases not taking, uh, and as well as you know some actions the county has taken in closing other businesses down or exciting other businesses. And so obviously I wanna say first and foremost that the vast majority of businesses that we have interacted with have been extremely cooperative and extremely interested in making sure that they protect their, uh, their clients and, and visitors. And so we thank them very much for those efforts. And, and I, when I say the vast majority, I'm talking the vast, vast majority of them doing exactly what they should be doing. In some limited cases, either through lack of knowledge or, or 
in most cases, even those who were not compliant just made a mistake and have learned from that mistake and are now are now doing well. There are a select few, however, who are putting profits ahead of people's lives. And for that, we'll not, we're, we're not gonna permit that. Uh, we are going to be out enforcing and in cases where we find people who are being wanton and in disregard for the public health orders, those businesses will be cited. And if those citations are deemed as being just the cost of doing business, they will be closed. Uh, and that's simply the way things are gonna have to go. We do not wanna close businesses. We just, we just wanna see compliant safe operation of our establishments in Montgomery County. Uh, but obviously, it, you know, the, we can't, from a public health perspective, allow businesses to disregard the public health orders and trying to make some statement about whether they disagree with the face covering order or what have you. Um, those are and have the force of law and they will be treated as such. And frankly, in many cases, the violations are not solely Montgomery County violations, they're state violations. And so um, I, I want to be very clear about where we stand in terms of enforcement and um, you know, thank the vast, vast majority of businesses who are doing exactly what we have asked them to do and what they know to be right to protect the, the lives of their, of their employees and the visitors. Talk about that. Okay, is that everything? Council Member Glantis. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank my colleagues for, for all of their, their good questions. Um, I too had, had some questions about the uh, senior community centers, uh, healthcare facilities, and appreciate Council Member Friedson for, for asking those. But Dr. Stoddard, you ended with, um, with, with a thought that, that I wanna um, address, uh, and it's regarding compliance. You know, we are seeing record numbers of positive cases throughout the country because communities are opening too soon. Uh, the residents and the business owners are ignoring the data and the science, uh, and they are not social distancing and not even wearing masks. Um, uh, blatantly just uh, going about their business as, as if there is no global pandemic. And, uh, you know, here in Montgomery County, as you mentioned, and has been mentioned in, in uh, some, some media, there have been some restaurants that have been non-compliant. You know, there have been uh, a number of hookah bars, a lounge, and um, most notably now a, a restaurant in unincorporated Gaithersburg, who uh, the owner of, of which said that they will not have their staff wear masks. And so uh, I'm curious what the compliance has been. You mentioned it's been generally good, but what has the reaction been when um, residents are calling 311 as I've been directing them to do uh, when they see non-compliance. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more about how systemic this might be and, and how uh, our agencies and departments are going about trying to correct these, these wrongs? Sure, um, so um, thank you for referring people to 311. That's certainly where we want them to go. So what happens when they call 311, those are sent to uh, H HHS is licensure and regulatory, which Dr. Gales oversees. And from there, they're shared with a team of people, depending on the nature of the, the, the concern or the complaint. Um, if, the, if, it, if, it, if it meets the level of sending out an HHS inspector immediately, that's what happens. If it's, if it's related to a bar or a restaurant, it may be ABS inspectors and or HHS that's working together. Uh, in cases where, uh, and so, so all of them are followed up with. And so depending on the nature of the concern, they're followed up with either via a visit or a call that day or subsequent days thereafter. Now, what I would say is, and we, we had um, some enhanced, so where we've heard a lot of concerns, and I think this is this should be very clear, is uh, what we've seen a lot of is where restaurants are operating late at night is a particular area of concern. And so after the dinner period has over, is over and, the bar, and they start to operate more like your traditional bar might, um, um, that's when ma m many of the, of the most significant violations have been both observed and reported. Uh, not to say that we're not seeing in, in, in retail establishments and other locations you know, intermediate reports, but I would say the vast majority of concerns that we've seen raised have been in the restaurant sector, um, particularly as it relates to the consumption of alcohol around bars. Um, and so 
Um, that would be the vast majority of areas where we've heard concerns raised and had to, had to do compliance visits related to. That. Now, um, when we go out there, many cases, uh, the observations when we arrive, um, obviously we see what we see when we get there. And so we can't know what had been done two hours before, but we know what we see when we get there. Um, in many cases, the non-compliance is um, maybe not complete wearing of face coverings, maybe, you know, five feet of distance instead of six, not egregious violations where education is the appropriate mechanism. And we educate them and then we typically do a follow-up to ensure that that education has taken hold. Um, now, obviously, and, and so we very much appreciate residents reporting this because we can't be everywhere at every time. And so residents, eyes and ears reporting back, particularly when they see things that are particularly unsafe. Now, um, we are also pairing up this with education because as you said, in many cases, it's businesses not realizing what they're expected to do in some cases. And so we are having, you know, we're working on a strategy, a, a collective strategy. I know we've talked about, you know, testing plan. We're working on a similar plan for our enforcement because we realize that there's an education component and there's a, there's a, you know, citation violation process. And we're trying to do both of those things together. We know we had a great success with our ambassador program. And frankly, um, we're likely to bring it back in a, in a separate, in another iteration because we went out to nearly 3,000 businesses. We received uh, enormously positive um, feedback from that program, from our businesses to say that it was very helpful for people to be out there talking to them. And I suspect we're gonna be bringing them back in another form to do education and then simultaneously pairing that with the back end for those businesses who are uh, flagrantly disregarding the rules, not just not aware of them to, to well, have the citation. And, and, and Dr. Starter, um, with, with regard to people who are witnessing um, flagrant violations, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people have sent me links on, you know, uh, Reddit feeds, uh, you know, and other, other areas of social media. Um, are those types of online media, um, enough to warrant uh, a violation, a fine or, or, you know, a stern warning? What, what happens uh, if someone captures something uh, versus seeing it firsthand? So it will depend on the nature of what's observed. So for example, if we, I mean, because, I mean, as you, as you well know, um, all of this has to stand up to scrutiny of the, of the, of the legal system as well. Right. So, um, it, it comes down to like, what's the strength of the, of the evidence associated with whatever the violation is. Now, people have asked, will you ever get a citation for a first time offense? And the short answer to that question is it depends. If you are egregious in your violation, you may get a first time citation. In most cases, if it's, if it's a, a marginal violation, there will be education component. We're not looking to be punitive with businesses to the extent that we can be, but as I think I've said before, we will not allow, and so to, to, to answer your question is, is it depends. I wish I could say it more concretely than that, but it could be in some circumstances that we had video that we could, that we knew was from a particular event, or we had uh, enough eyewitness reports of an activity, we could come in and, and make a, an action based on that. That would not necessarily be a universal rule in all cases though. I, I, I appreciate that. So then let, uh, let's just be very clear that if people see um, improper, I, if people see improper actions, uh, sure, take photos, take videos um, so that you can call out the offenders, but then call 311 so that the county uh, staff can get on site and correct that action as quickly as possible. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're keenly aware of the incident that occurred on Facebook uh, over the weekend with one of our restaurants and, you know, um, having observed and read through many of the comments, I think I was uh, heartened by the fact that many of our residents recognized that that was not behavior that they could support. And they made it very clear to the particular business who posted that. But on the back end, the county is also aware of that posting and uh, we'll be taking the appropriate action to follow up with that to ensure that uh, what was referenced in, in that uh, uh, Facebook post will not proceed. I mean, sure. uh, I, I appreciate that and appreciate your action and, and uh, public statements, you too, Dr. Gales, with regard to making sure that um, not only patrons, but also employees, you know, yes. of these restaurants are protected while they're trying to make a living. Um, let me just let, let me just pivot just real quickly. One other question. Uh, 
someone has contacted me who owns a photography studio and specializes particularly in uh, photography of newborns, uh, which is a timely subject. Uh, and they were asking whether or not they are able to open and, and provide their services to, to families. I believe I'm aware of the, the, this particular call. Um, and um, I, I, I want to make sure I, I give you the right answer. So I, I'd like to give it follow up with me, follow up with you. But um, I know particularly the one of the concerns was uh, as it relates to this. I mean, um, we, when we originally discussed this very issue, and I, I, I think it's the same one given the way you described it. Um, the initial issue was, well, okay, you could probably do good physical distancing during photography, but as I recall, this was a newborn and you have to pose the newborn in a certain way, which requires closer interaction. And we don't, we don't recommend use of face coverings for those under the age of two. And so that it may be a very nuanced example where it may not be appropriate given what the requirements of that particular uh, business are, but uh, we'll follow up to confirm that. Great, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you all very much for, for your ongoing work. Uh, back, uh, I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much. And I wanna uh, pick up on something that you said, Dr. Stoddard, and then also swing it to Dr. Gales as well. Um, so if we have businesses that are openly violating, not only local, but state, uh, because my understanding is I'm looking at the website for Maryland e -com uh, Commerce, and it says uh, that face coverings are required when interacting with other staff or guests. I mean, it's very clear, it's on the website. So they're not only violating local, but they're vi violating this, the state ordinance by the governor as well. Why do we then need to do four rounds of uh, checking to see if they're not, you know, adhering to policy? And then on top of it, when you talk about egregious, I mean, there's nothing more egregious than saying, and I'm not gonna do it, so what? You know, I mean, it doesn't get more egregious than that. I'm trying to figure out what else we would need to do in that sense. Now, again, I understand we're not trying to pick fights here and I'm not trying to make examples. I'm not trying to put Montgomery County on the map of the national spotlight and have the president. But the reality is, is that this is an example. I mean, we're, we're either setting an example and saying that we're having folks adhere to these policies or we're not. And there is no gray area. I mean, it's very cut and dry. And so if someone could just explain to me how this doesn't rise to the level of the most egregious and this place should have been shut down and fined from the beginning, I, I just need help in understanding that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I certainly would like Dr. Gale's time on this, but I think we're, you and I are on the same page that this restaurant will not reopen uh you want you know once the post was made they were already closed they were, they were closed of their own volition at that point and and my understanding is that they don't reopen until thursday um, they will not reopen on thursday under the circumstances of what they've posted now so so just to be crystal clear about that um, and so this is a perfect example of, of where we had gotten a we had gotten a report last week that they had you know face covering compliance issue we went in and educated them. The post was made after the visit, as, as I think the, the post was alluding to. But once we saw that that was the atmosphere or the attitude of the owner operator and how they were going to proceed, that absolutely changes the calculus from it being a educational to a enforcement action based solely on that, on, on that posting. And so um, to be clear, that facility will not open again under that premise. Understood. Let me just, and before D Dr. Gales jumps in, let me just say that, so when we went out there and talked with them the first time when we had interaction with them, I'm assuming that was not the response we got and they immediately Correct. put on masks? Okay. Correct. Okay, all right, Dr. Gales. I was just gonna add your, Great question um, and observation. The state has been notified because I think it's important for folks at home as we actually had a conversation earlier this morning is I think there are times where 
we the county is made to seem that we are out of step in terms of what the state allows but we've been very clear that the violation in this instance violated not only what we put forward at the county level but also violated the rule in terms of what the governor's rule has been that has been put into place so the state team has been notified we've worked with them in this particular situation um, i don't want to go into details about this in case we we happen to find ourselves in litigation or related to that but what i can say is that um, at least from the health perspective is that we are looking at um, all of the potential remedies that we have in place not only for this particular situation but any of the situations that pop up and we'll be happy to talk with you offline about it in more detail yeah, it, it, it's just incredibly concerning. And I know that the council president is concerned about it. It's in his district and it borders mine. And so certainly one in which just from a parochial standpoint, in terms of trying to mitigate against any kinds of outbreaks, we already had a gentleman lose his life at the McDonald's in Montgomery Village. So we know that we're not immune uh, in this area from losing people who are working at restaurants from contracting COVID and the potential of transferring it to other employees as well. And so from that perspective, I mean, we're talking about life and death here. We're not just talking about somebody's individual freedoms and rights uh, that they proclaim uh, is higher than the laws of the state of Maryland. And so uh, from that perspective, I just I just really wanna make sure we're on the same page. Um, so uh, I, I did wanna follow up on a question that I'd asked you guys before. Uh, which was access to cleaning supplies and others. And so Dr. Stoddard, I'm very happy to hear that you said that we're doing that for uh, our early care uh, providers and that's fantastic. But when it comes to access for some of our businesses that are out there that are still trying to access, and it's getting a little bit easier, but it's still a challenge uh, to get access to uh, quality PPE as well as cleaning supplies. Have we been able to make any progress when it comes to uh, helping our local small businesses that are out there that are basically uh, relying upon Amazon or, you know, some of our big box stores to get them what they need that oftentimes is delayed uh, or is not available at all. Part of the work of the ambassador program was actually to provide PPE out into the field with many of our small businesses. And so whenever we conducted one of those 3000 visits, if we found people who didn't have enough PPE, we actually provided it as a as a as a as a direct um, vision. Now, obviously, um, it becomes extremely challenging if we are if the county is going to have to support the PPE needs of all of our businesses, the county and and nursing home. Like, you know, there is obviously a limit to our ability to acquire the resources. We've been very successful in getting them ourselves, but and we have been. I mean, when I say we've been more more. Uh, out, you know, put out more PP than anyone else that I'm aware of state, regional. We've done, we, we've gone way, 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 way beyond many of our, anyone else. Uh, um, and so, and we'll continue to do that. But, but at a certain point, you know, we, we start to run up against our own limitations as well. So I, I do want to make sure that that's clear. No, I appreciate that and understand. And, and I know there's only so much that we can do and it's just, you know, whatever we can help them with is great. I just have one last uh, question, Mr. Chair, and it relates to uh, our schools. Um, and just curious, and this is more, I guess, for Dr. Gales, but you also, Dr. Stoddard, since you guys both talked about it in terms of reopening our schools, uh, there's been tremendous discussion, not only around the safety of the children themselves, but also when it comes to their families, whether it's parents or grandparents, and then also the uh, health of our staff. Uh, and so, um, being that there's a lot more conversation around indoors versus outdoors and the risk associated with indoor congregation versus outdoor congregation, obviously with our uh, HVAC systems in many schools that are very antiquated uh, and are not at the same level uh, as which they should be when it comes to purification nor moving the air uh, as efficiently as in some of the other schools. Um, ha have we looked at that at all as precursors for where we might want to be more stringent versus more lenient when it comes to how many children, where they are, all those kinds of things? Have we gotten into those kinds of details yet, or is it more just uh, generic at this point? MCPS has certainly gotten into those level of details. Um, 
I mean, I don't want to get ahead of, of sharing where, where they're at necessarily beyond where they're comfortable with, because I know that they're also talking with the, you know, their staff and making sure that whatever they say, their staff are comfortable with too. I know that's sort of an ongoing thing that the school system has undertaken, but um, from the plan that they've, the draft plan that they've shared so far, they've gotten into those level of details and certainly um, um, are very concerned about the same thing and how they, you know, can deal with that in the context of some of the aging infrastructure that they have, they have as well. And so I don't want to, um, you know, I certainly think that they, I, I'd be more comfortable with them sharing the details of their plan, but yes, they've gotten into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, just as a time check, and Councilmember Jawando has not spoken, so he will not be under any time constraint, but we do have Councilmember Auburnaz and Councilmember Navarro who also want to speak again. And we have 15 minutes because we're supposed to go to um, have the virtual brown bag lunch with the regional service centers directors at, at 12.30. At 1.30, we have eight public hearings and we're very tight because we have interviews afterwards. So Council Member Jawando next, and then I'm gonna ask Council Members Albernaz and Navarro to please uh, limit their conversation to as quickly as they can. Council Member Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, no pressure. I'll, I'll, none I'll whatsoever, say. none. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard for all your work. I always wanna start that way because I, I know you're working very, we all know you're working very hard and uh, have the best interests of all county residents in mind. Um, totally un want to associate myself with the testing capacity uh, questions and concerns. Um, obviously, uh, I'm glad Councilmember Albernaz brought up uh, where I used to live in Quebec Terrace and, and, and those apartments. And we toured those with Councilmember uh, Reamer and some others a few months back as well. And a whole bunch of issues going on there. But this is certainly an issue that underscores a problem throughout the county of, of these multifamily housing units and folks who uh, are not getting tested, have gone through issues. Uh, I was talking to a family last weekend in White Oak with very similar story. Um, and, and we have to get a handle on this as we enter a whole new phase. Uh, it, it's interesting, we're in this kind of awkward, as hair growth is, gets in an awkward phase and everything else, we're in this phase of kind of open, but not really. And what do you do and what do you wear and how can you go and where do you sit at the restaurant? And as all that happens, I think, as at the same time we have i saw a map the other day of all the 40 plus states that have had increases and maryland was not highlighted but everyone around us was and and you just you just think about how long can we hold that at bay we i'm really proud of what we've done here and what you all have led as far as the steps we've taken to mitigate that um but i think we're at a very uh, vulnerable time particularly as it gets hot and people go outside. It, there's just a lot of factors going on. And the ability to have massive uh, availability of testing, particularly in communities that we know uh, have, have been under-tested and have not had access and all the steps we've been taking together to address that, I just want to underscore how important. And I, and I know that's been talked about and I know you get it, but please let us know. I've been talking to Dr. Crowell about uh, ways not only in the testing but once we identify people how can we help them uh, whether through our hotel strategy or other ideas that we're working on to get people separated how do we ramp up the contact dressing i know you're working on this all day every day but it's just so important especially at this critical moment um i did want to ask about uh the restrict travel restrictions i've been getting some questions from folks when you when i talked about that map there are some states where you have to when you enter, you have to be quarantined. You can't come in. Uh, I'm not aware of that in Maryland at this point, but I, I want for the people who have questions about that, is that being discussed at the state level? Are you thinking about it at the county level? Where are those conversations? I guess this would be to both of you or Dr. Gales first about those types of restrictions going forward. Sure, um, I, it has been introduced um, to, this, to the governor's office. Um, when we had our, our health officer meeting last week, actually, I pushed that forward. So I sent the question up to say, is this being considered? Uh, I was told I would get some some feedback. I haven't heard anything yet. So I'm not sure it is something that uh, the governor's office is considering. Uh, we have had internal discussions here in terms of what that looks like. Um, I have also polled and surveyed the health officers across the National Capital Region as well to see what is the 
um, the app, not necessarily the appetite, but what efforts are, are being put into place. At this point, I don't think any jurisdiction has put forth anything. Uh, we have discussed it from the perspective of potentially uh, in terms of if there are, you know, first line responders or essential employees who may be going to those jurisdictions um, in terms of putting in restrictions for them when they come back. Um, but nothing has been formalized yet, but I can, I can definitely attest to something that we have talked about at length. And it will probably be ongoing because unfortunately the number, as you pointed out, the number of jurisdictions who meet those criteria or concerning criteria has increased over the last three or four days. I appreciate that. Please keep us posted. That's something that I'm glad you raised it with the governor. I think, you know, we need to consider that as the board of health and as the county and, uh, you know, as a state and as a region, as, as you said. So I'm glad those conversations are going on. Please keep us posted. The other thing is, last question I have uh, for, for now, and I'll follow up offline on a couple of other smaller things. We still, and it's my understanding, we still do not have the data, not only by zip code, but by race of the cases and deaths. Do we have that specific level data of it, by uh, all the demographic data that we need as far as te who's been tested, who's been uh, contracted, and who has died by race, ethnicity, uh, and location. Do we have all access to all of that? Yes. Yeah, so the the death, so the, the the information that you described for deaths is more complete uh, because it's it's pulled from vital records. Um, and so the the deaths by race has actually been posted on our data dashboard site. Um, it's towards the bottom of the page. It's easy to miss, but it's it's towards the bottom of the page. And the death data is by age and by race. We've not put it up by zip code, but we could do that because we do have the home addresses of those who have passed away. Um, and so as it relates to who's been tested in terms of um, that data, that data is limited. So we pull, the state puts together a weekly compendium of by race uh, in terms of, I believe, I know it's done by case. And so by case, I want to say we have race and ethnic data for probably 60 to 65% of the cases. It's missing in some. And so from that information, uh, we've been able to try to piece it together on a jurisdiction level. And so that's actually a part of the, what I'm going to send you all by email refers to the case rate that um, Dr. Liu and his team here have taken that information and put together, and you'll be able to see the trends for cases per 100,000 residents by each month and how that's changed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to getting that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, uh, next is Council Member Auburnaz and Council Member Navarro. Um, and, and I hate to always okay. do this. I know, we, I got it, I got it. Okay, uh, all right. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I am in the awkward hair growth phase uh, to, to Council Member Jawando's point earlier. <laughs> um, the Just a quick question. So I'm not confident if this administration gets a second term that there will be a national strategy on the dissemination of vaccines and that we will, just as we have been with testing, be effectively on our own. And so it is incredible news that a local company has received the 1.2 or so billion dollar grant. Um, but Dr. Stoddard, have we reached out to that company? Are there plans to reach out to that company or others uh, to engage in a discussion about whether or not the county can be first in line uh, to, to have access to some of these vaccines? I know we've had conversations with them in other contexts, obviously not since this morning's announcement. And I certainly think that's something that we're going to follow up on. And just to add to your point, I am confident that there will not be a national strategy around dissemination of vaccine if this administration it continues. So I think your point is extremely well taken. Dr. Yells. And, and to that end, um, I won't make any political comments, but I agree with, with what you both have said in terms of a strategy, because there's been no strategy, period, verbally or written um, for any of this. Um, but from a vaccine standpoint, recognizing that, and we're not going to wait to see who's elected or not elected. Uh, our team at Dennis Avenue, the disease control team, has been working on a vaccine distribution strategy for uh, several weeks now, uh, recognizing that, uh, well, we hope that moves forward and we hope that we have a viable candidate by the end of the year. Um, and so as we think through our strategies for flu vaccination clinics and things like that, I've asked the team to think about how that we could integrate a COVID vaccine within that and what a larger distribution and dissemination plan would look like. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Council Member Navarro, he came in under budget. Council Member Navarro, please. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to point out, I didn't mention at the at conclusion of my remarks earlier that there was some issues that were brought up to my attention regarding the testing hotline and 311, et cetera. I just, somebody just sent me a tweet from the Department of um, Health and Human Services that indeed the Dennis Avenue Health Center uh, phone service is not working and that, that this includes the testing helpline and they're working on that. So um, it is, I guess, confirmed that there was some issues there um, and just want to obviously ask that as soon as that is resolved, I don't know if it has been already, but I, I didn't, okay, that's wonderful because I had not received a response to my message yesterday, um, but I'm glad that it has been resolved. And if this happens again, if we can just uh, get you know um, notified so that we can let folks know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Gales for being here with us.